And so I, I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that, uh, you know, we are, we're here today, but we're not gonna leave the same. And I also know that after this Thanksgiving, you're also not going to come back the same because we're all gonna grow in the Lord, amen? amen. Okay? How many love to eat? Some of my foodies got that one. Um, but uh, it's gonna be an awesome time. And so today, I wanna jump into this message. You guys ready? Okay, I got that side. You guys ready? Okay. So today, we're starting just a two-week series really over this Thanksgiving season called Reasons. Everyone say Reasons. Reasons. People do things in life for their reasons. Not really about my reasons, but your reasons are going to be completely different than mine. And you will do and live your life in such a way because of your reasons. But it's going to be hard for me to impose my reasons onto you. Would you agree? So people will do things for their reasons and not ours. But if you're wanting to reach someone, if you're wanting to connect with someone, then you've got to find out what are their reasons. Reasons are powerful. And we're going to jump in these next two weeks, and today I'm going to get to talk to you about worship and the reason why we sing, the reason why music plays such a huge part in the church today. Next week, we're going to be talking to you about the reasons of community, the reasons behind community and why, what are the reasons. And so I want to jump in and share with you guys an Old Testament story. Is that okay? Okay. The, uh, the, the verses and stuff will be on the screen. If you've got the Mesa Church app, you can open that today and you'll see the notes as well. You can follow along with me and take notes. Thank you, Ellis. I love you, bro. We're going to jump into 2 Chronicles Chapter 20, verses 15 through 23. And before I read that, let's pray together. God, we thank you once again for your goodness to us. Lord, we thank you for this place and this opportunity, God, to dive into your word. And we ask right now that your word would come alive like a double-edged sword, that you would come and speak into our hearts. But God, more importantly than just speak into our hearts, as we talk about reasons today, God, I pray that you would help us to really navigate the things that we, we talk about so that we can truly see your heart for the reason behind our worship and the reason why we sing. And it's in your precious name we pray. And everybody said? Amen. 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 Hey, if you're watching on Mesa Online, my name's Pete. So glad to have you guys joining us. Why don't you put some emojis in the chat, put some praise hands, all that good stuff. All right. So here we go. Second Chronicles chapter 20. In verse 15, he says this. He said, listen, all you people of Judah and Jerusalem, listen, King Jehoshaphat. This is what the Lord says. Ready? Do not be afraid. Don't be discouraged by the mighty army, for the battle is not yours, but whose? God's. God's. I want you to say that louder. God's. Okay? Verse 16. Tomorrow... March out against them. You will find them coming up through the ascent of Ziz at the end of the valley that opens into the wilderness of Jeriel. But you will not even need to what? Fight. Fight. Then he says, take your positions. Then stand still and watch the Lord's victory for why he is with you. <coughs> o people of Judah and Jerusalem, and may I even say today, O people of Mesa Church, O people of Orange County, the Lord is with you. The Lord is with you. The Lord is with you. You see, then King Jehoshaphat bowed low with his face to the ground, and all the people of Judah and Jerusalem did the same, worshiping the Lord. Then the Levites from the clans of Kohath and Korah stood to praise the Lord, the God of Israel, with a very loud shout. And early the next morning, the army of Judah went out into the wilderness of Tekoa on the way to Jehoshaphat, and they stopped and said, listen to me, all you people of Judah and Jerusalem, believe the Lord your God, and you will be able to stand firm. Believe in his prophets, and you will succeed. And then in verse 21, it says this, after consulting the people, the king appointed what? Singers, Singers to walk ahead of the army singing to the Lord and praising him for his holy splendor. This 
is what they sang. You ready for this? Give thanks to the Lord, for his faithful love endures forever. And in verse 22, it says, At that very moment they began to sing, and they gave praise, and the Lord caused the armies of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir to start fighting among themselves. So the armies of Moab and Ammon turned against their allies from Mount Seir and killed every one of them. Can everybody say, that's messed up? I don't know what kind of song. Hey, I like music, and I know some of you, you know, you've got your AirPods or different things like that, and you're listening to your music. I mean, if there's some music that you listen to and it completely overthrows your mind and your free will and all that, and you start knocking other people out, like, I'm going to run. I'll be the first one out the door, okay? Can you imagine that? I mean, just think about it. The people of Israel are singing, give thanks to the Lord for his love endures forever. And all of a sudden, because of that, they're just singing and worshiping the Lord. And all of a sudden, these two armies turn against each other and they start knocking each other's heads off. It's crazy. See, the armies of Moab, right, they turned against their allies and killed them. And then after they destroyed that army, they began attacking each other. Could you imagine? It's like, yeah, we're fighting, you know, doing all this stuff. And it's like, all right, you got my back. Oh, yeah, I got your back. Not, right? <laughs> Messed up. Messed up. But here we see something very, very important, something very valuable about the reason behind our singing, the reason of why we worship how many of you know that where faith exists, fear cannot stay? I'm going to say that again. Where faith exists, fear cannot stay. It has no place. It has no right. It has no authority. And so today, we're going to talk about the spiritual practice of worship. Everyone say worship. worship. See, worship is not something that we do. It's something that we were created for. It's our reason, our reason. Whether you believe it or not, we're all worshiping something. And the question that I have for you today when it comes to our worship is, where's our focus? Where's our affection? Where's our love and our sense of all going? So when I talk about worship, where are those things? Where are they being focused? Where are they being directed? Where, what is catching our attention? What is catching our heart? What, is, what are we fixing our eyes on? That's the reason. That's the reason. So instead of just doing a broad definition of worship today, I really want to dive deeper and talk about this idea that as a people of God, if, you, if you're in this place today and you're, you, 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 you may be new and you, or you feel new, you know, I just want to welcome you guys. And some of you, you may not know what this thing is about having a relationship and that's with Jesus and that's okay. But for some of us, if you believe in Jesus and you've come to experience his love and his grace and his mercy, come on somebody, and God has radically changed your life, then you've got an idea and an understanding to know what the reason is behind our worship. See, worship, we sing songs, we attach music to it, and we do it all for the glory of God. And there's no doubt that every aspect of our life should bring glory to God. But I want to lean in today on what I call the practice of worship. The practice of worship. The reason of worship. The reason we sing songs with intricate melodies, the reason we sing songs with beautiful angelic harmonies, what is the reason? Here's the first point for you. Worship is the act of glorifying God in his presence with our voices and our what? Hearts. So worship is not a new thing. It's not a modern day thing. It's not a thing that we're doing here in 2022. It's not hymns. It's not what some of us would call CCM, which is contemporary Christian music. It's not that. It's not a thing that we do in church so that we can just have an emotional response to fix 
or a fix to where we can say things like, wow, that felt so good. See, some of us, we've lost our reason and we go through worship experiences and the emotions and everything, those play a pl- they have a place. But sometimes we get so caught up in those things that it's like a drug and if we don't feel it and if we don't feel like it was expressed in the right way with the right amount of energy, with the right amount of love, with the right amount of this and that, you fill in the blank, then we feel like we missed it. Worship. It's been a practice of the church since the very beginning. You see, as a follower of Jesus, I want to declare and let us know today that we are a singing faith. Catch this. We are a singing faith. When you go back to the beginning, you'll see that men and women have been singing to give God glory. Why? What's the reason? Because it's a part of their heritage. It's a part of their heritage. It's a value. And it goes deeper than just the song. That's the reason. See Colossians 3 verses 16 through 17 out of the New Living says this. Let the message about Christ in all its richness, what? Fill your lives. Teach and counsel each other with all the wisdom he gives. And then he says, sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to God with what? Thankful hearts. And whatever you do or say, do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. That's a pretty good reason. See, whatever you do, whether you're a stay-at-home mom, whether if you're a first responder, whether if you're a creative and you're in the graphic design business, whatever, whether you're a high CEO and you, and you, or you're a leader with a lot of influence, or you're just the person who makes shakes at McDonald's. Whatever you do, whatever your role, whether you're a pastor, whether you're serving on a dream team, whether you're helping run audio in the back for a production, whatever it may be, guess what? You have an opportunity and you have a reason to worship. No matter what your responsibility, do everything in the name of See, Paul gives us specific reasons for singing praise and worship, but then he also makes it clear that whatever I do should be an act of worship. So we're to sing. We can open up our mouth to praise God with psalms. We can lift up Jesus with melodies and harmonies. We are called to worship. Amen? Amen. So it's remarkable that when you actually start diving into church history and you start studying what it was like in the beginning of the Bible, you can see that the people of God from the very beginning, from the very beginning, and they were called the church, they they called the church to gather. Why? What was the reason? So they could worship. We can go all the way back to the Old Testament when the Hebrew people were enslaved under Egypt for 400 years. And then one day... God calls this man by the name of who? Moses, right? We can show this on here, on the screen. God calls this man by the name of Moses. Man, Moses, you're looking pretty, uh, right? So you got Moses coming in, and he's going to speak to Pharaoh, and he comes up with these special words that God gives him to say, because Moses, of course, when he first gets called, when he first sees the burning bush and all these different things, and God is speaking to him, he's like, yeah, not me, Lord. Why don't you send somebody else? Can I, can I just commend Moses for being honest and real at the moment? Because so many of us, we have that internal thought when God asks us to do something. Amen. <laughs> All right, we hit something over there, right? <laughs> but he calls Moses to speak to Pharaoh. The Israelites, the Hebrew people were under slavery, he catches this for over 400 years, and then one day God calls Moses, and not just any man, but a stuttering, stuttering guy. 
And he calls the stutterer to, to go to Pharaoh, right? The, the, the main man over Egypt to speak to him? God, you are crazy sometimes. But what does he do? He calls him to, to speak to Pharaoh. And then after they are, God brings them out of slavery in Egypt, right? Then they're called into this promised land. They're, they're, they, they know that God has called them to a promised land, but yet they have to wander. <laughs> they have to wander. And Moses goes in to speak to Pharaoh, and he says out of Exodus 7, 16, let my people go. I love that line. We always talk about that line. We always focus on that first part of that verse. But can we look at the second part and see how crazy that is? God calls Moses to talk to Pharaoh to say, let my people go so they can worship me in the what? The wilderness. I was expecting some better accommodations. <laughs> like, God, if you're going to free me from slavery, I'm expecting, like, at least get me a bed and a room. Man, room service would be real nice. Come on, right? But he says, let my people go. Moses knew the drill so that they can worship me in the wilderness. See, God wants you to go so that you can do something. The very first idea that we have of church is in the Old Testament. They had this thing that was called the tabernacle. Everyone say tabernacle. See, the Hebrew people went into the wilderness on their way to the promised land, and they had to wander for not one year, not five years, not 10 years, not 20 years, but 40 years. And each camp had a specific direction from God. And so when every time the camps would have to set up shop, at the center of their camp, they had to set up what was called their tabernacle. Can we throw this picture up for me? They had to set up what was called this tabernacle. So if you look at this tabernacle here, right, this is the Hebrew ta the tabernacle, the court of the tabernacle. It's the size, check out this. That's the size of an American football field. Look at how big that is right there. You've got the temple, you've got the brazen labor, the brazen altar, the court of the tabernacle. They would have to go in and set up these tables, which would then be used for slaughtering. They would have the brazen, the bronze bowl, bowl the, the, the altar where they would actually make the sacrifices, and then they would have to set up the temple. They'd have to put up the pillars that were all the way around the camp, and then they set up the temple, which I want you to check this out, right? Number one, oops, go back. Okay, yeah, there you go. No, you're good. Oops, sorry. I just totally messed you all up. Okay, sorry. I got happy fingers. Okay, right? So the first one, first area is the Holy of Holies. They had the Ark of the Covenant. There was the veil. There was the altar of incense. They had the lampstand or what was called today, right? It's the menorah. You've got the table of the showbread. You've got the outer veil. This was called the holy place. Right, and then the Holy of Holies, there was only certain select people that were allowed to go into the Holy of Holies. And when they went into the Holy of Holies, these guys would have bells attached to their ankle and a rope, and you would hear them walking in, and all of a sudden, if it got way too quiet, brother did not fall asleep. <laughs> he died. Because it's where the presence of God was. And I want us to think about this for a moment. So the Hebrew people get called out of the wilderness, and they had to wander for over 40 years. And every time, right, they had to set up their tabernacle. They had to do all of those different things. Can I let you know that this was the first portable church? <laughs> first portable church, guys. And they were setting up not anything simple and not anything that wasn't fancy because they had gold pillars. They had all of the different things, all of the different elements. This was the first portable church. And you think about our story. You think about Mesa Church's story, even going all the way back into the days where Jordan, Pastor Jordan has shared with us, is starting out in Blackie's Bar and then the transitions and all of the... The, the journey that God has brought this church. And then even for us, right, for a, over a year and a half, almost two years, we were portable sitting up at the Double Tree Hotel. Come on, somebody. Yeah. 
And we're thankful for where we get to stand today. But we know this isn't it. This isn't the arrival. We're still on a journey. We're still going through a process. And that's hard to say amen to. But it's the worship. To worship, to gather, to seek the Lord. See, God's presence dwelt and the beautiful picture of this tabernacle is that it was, it, it's the first portable church, man. i just just thinking about it. See, all of the tribes would be positioned around the tabernacle. And it was a picture of a group of people stating that God would always be where? At the center. At the center. The whole reason that God wanted to get the people out of Egypt was so that he can, they could get into a place where they would worship freely. Because how many of you know as a slave, that's hard to do. We have people all over the world who are doing that and they're losing their lives because of it. What a privilege we have. But do we take it for granted? See, God always brings you out in order to bring you in. God always brings you out in order to bring you in. See, God brings them out of slavery to bring them into his presence. Catch that. And how this correlates in today so well. God brings the Hebrew people out of slavery into his presence. God desires and he sent his son and we're going to celebrate him in Christmas time. Jesus born on this earth. God, Emmanuel, God with us, right? God took the Hebrew people out of slavery so that they could be in presence with him. God sent his son Jesus who died on the cross and then rose again so that we who are full of sin can be set free and be in presence with him. With him. So God will always bring you out in order to bring you in. This isn't something that was done many, many years ago, but it's what God does today. It's what he, he does in my life, what he desires to do in yours, what he desires as a process, as a journey, that it's not just a one and done thing, but we're continuing day by day to claim the freedom, to walk in the joy, to experience the goodness of God by surrendering ourselves and picking up our cross and following after him. That's the reason. See, God brought you out of anxiety to bring you into his peace. I will declare today that God brought some of you out of sickness to bring you into his healing. God brought you out of guilt and shame and into grace and freedom. God brought you out of a depression and into joy. God brought you out of being lost and alone, and into his purpose and his family. God always brings you out so that he can bring you in. See, if we're gonna be the church, our primary reason is to worship. And if we don't do that, then who are we? We're not actually who we say that we are. It's not just about telling people about our faith. It's not just about passing out an invite or a door hanger, right? But it's about putting things into practice. And the question I have for you is this, what do you do when you don't know what to do? What do you do when you don't know what to do? <laughs> Maybe you find yourself here today or watching online, you're like, hey, Pete, can I just let you know it has been a week? And can I tell you personally, I agree. <laughs> For some of you, maybe it's been a month. For some of you, you've lost count. And you just have no idea. What do you do? 
What are the reasons? What are our habits? What's our behavior pattern like? We don't want bad habits, right? We don't want to get stuck in cycles or in addictions or in different things, but ultimately, deep down inside, when we come to know Jesus and experience his love and his freedom, we, may there be something that stirs up that we want to develop faith habits that show up even when we don't know what to do. Even when I don't have a 10-step plan. Even when I scroll through social media and it's not giving me what I'm looking for. What do you do? What you do daily determines who you become permanently. So knowing how to do things, right? Knowing how to do things is good. It's awesome. Can we, can we agree to that? Like having experience, having knowledge, know, being able to walk into a situation or a circumstance or, or navigating feelings or navigating, you know, just different things. It's good to have a know and an understanding sometimes. Because we've all been there when we've walked into a situation or we've had to deal with something and we're like, I'm definitely not going to be able to play this off, right? And then you find somebody who actually knows a little bit and you're like, yeah, exactly what they said. Knowing how to do things is always good, but before you can know how, you've got to know the why. You've got to know the reason. See, if you don't know the reason why, if you don't know the reason you do something, here's the truth. It doesn't matter how good you do it, eventually you'll give up. If you don't know the reason why you do something, it doesn't matter how good you do it. Eventually, you will give up. If you don't know why you're singing, if you don't know why worship is valuable or important, guess what? Eventually, you'll become a spectator in the crowd. You'll become hard-hearted to only have particular things that will melt the, the hardness of your heart where God's spirit can speak. Why? Because you don't know the reason. And our reason is this. We delight in God. Amen? When I delight in God, I want you to catch this. When I delight in God, when I worship God, he delights in me. Sometimes people can get confused with this. Sometimes people think that it needs to sound a certain way or to be a certain style. Some of us feel like, you know, our worship and our singing, it's got to sound like Gaither's Homecoming, Volume 57. Because we all know there's at least 50 plus albums out there. Some are on vinyl, but it's cool. It's cool. That's all, that's all come back. It's Christmas season, y'all. We can pull those vinyl players out. Some of you, it feels like it's got to sound like Gaither's Homecoming. Some of you, it feels like it's got to sound like Keith Green. Some of you feel like it's got to be like Vineyard. Some of you feel like it's got to be like Elevation or like Israel Houghton or Mav City. Come on, right? And God loves the sound. See, I stand here today as a husband, right, to my awesome wife, Sarah, and we have three kids, and I can stand here today to let you know, like, honestly, there is nothing I wouldn't do to hear the sound of my family. And that might be a little raw for some of you, because that could bring up some pressure things in your own life where you're missing the sound. But I think about the sound that my kids make when they are having a blast. And they're probably causing a ruckus that if I don't intervene, something will happen, dear Jesus. The sound of those that you love. God loves the sound. And can I encourage you today that God loves your sound. See, it's not the style of the sound, but it's the intention of the heart 
It's not the style of the music. It's not that it's a 4-4 or a 6-8 or a 3-4. It's not that it's 74 BPMs per minute. It's not that it's super duper fast where we're all rhythmically challenged and we're trying to go 133 per minute. I'm glad that some of you got that. And some of you are like, yep, I'm rhythmically challenged. I have no idea what you just said. Can you slow that down? Yes. See, all of us have been given a unique sound, and God wants nothing more than for us to use our lives and our gifts to honor him. Yet many of us think that our sound isn't good enough, or we think our sound is too much. And so instead of giving glory to God, we give ourselves or someone else's sound glory. Let that sink in for a moment. Because of doubt or fear or shame or not feeling like we're equipped or that we have the confidence to be able to stand in who God says that we are, we end up forgoing that and, 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 and not even using it when understanding it. God is like, I love your sound. Because just the sound of your worship, just the sound of your heart, it's like a father who weeps over his kids. The sound. The sound. See, God loves to hear you sing. You can be off pitch, dear Jesus. You could lack rhythm. You could be, you could be, now we're speaking to everybody. You could be, you could be sharp. You can be flat. You could be two verses behind. Come on, somebody. <laughs> I'm getting real, right? This is our reason. God loves your sound and he loves your style. If you've got to clap with the right hand over the left hand, hey, that's okay. You can't switch it up like some of those. Don't do that. That's too much. <laughs> See, when we worship, we draw near to God. And what does he do? He will always draw near to us. Jesus made it possible for us to not have to go to a temple. He made it possible for us to not have to set up this tabernacle. He made it possible for, not, for us to not have to put bells around our ankles so that if we stopped moving, we'd be dead. Even though bells around the ankles is coming back, I'm going to speak that today. I'm just messing, right? I'm kidding. I hope not. Oh, I almost went too real there for a second. You know what, as a little kid, I don't know if any of you guys ever had, I had, I had little socks with the little bells on them. Sorry. There you go, now you can make fun of me, that's good, awesome. Yeah, okay. Um, please nobody find that on Amazon and send that to me, please. I know some of you, I already have an, I know, there, dang it, okay. But Jesus made it possible for us to not have to go to a, te to a temple. He made it possible for us to not have to enter into a holy of holies, but we can draw near right where we are at. And I want to think of it this way. Think of it this way. Our worship, okay? How many of you guys, uh, you know those motion, those motion detectors for sliding doors when you go into like a Target or you go into a grocery store, or you go into a, a fancy department store, right? They've got some of them, they have those motion sliding doors, Right? Has anybody ever been one of those who actually thought they walked into the motion sliding door and you actually walked into the actual pane that was next to the motion sliding door? <laughs> yep, I've done that, guilty, okay? But in front of those motion sliding doors, they will always remain shut, majority of the time. But they will always remain shut until what happens? The motion sensor detects some activity. If you don't catch anything else today, this is the reason why your worship and your singing is so valuable and your sound is so valuable to God. Because here's the deal, God's blessing, God's favor, his heart for you as your, your dad, your godly, for your, 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 your father. He wants to see some motion. He wants to see some activity. There are some of you in this place today, you're, you're standing on the brink of a breakthrough and all you really need to do is start to initiate some motion and worship. Because then eventually something will happen and the sensor will go off and then the doors will be wide open and God will say, here I am. Will you step into what I've called you to? 
Would, I, would you step into the purpose and the plan that I have? Would you leave behind the baggage? Would you stop going through the cycles? Would you just trust me? Your worship is like the motion sensor. No matter how difficult things can be, we've got to keep drawing near. You've got to keep worshiping. You've got to keep singing. Give God praise daily because of the reason. See, when we sing and magnify God, we magnify God and his love and his goodness and his faithfulness and his character. See, our worship expands the image of who God is in our hearts and in our mind and man in our soul. See, when I focus my heart and my mind on God, it's there that he deeply changes my life. And it's a struggle to get there. But man, when he changes and he does something, I don't want to go back. Do you? Let me give you a reason. Because some of you may still be wondering, well, Pete, why do we sing? I just want to go and hear the word preached. I just want to get to the good stuff. I want to get to the meat. I don't want any of that milk. We all heard it said. If you're, if you're in these circles long enough, you hear stuff. Because it's a spiritual habit. See, the last thing I would tell you is worship is an act of war. Worship is an act of war. See, I love the zoo. Anybody here love the zoo? San Diego's got a pretty sweet zoo. Been there to their safari park. One of the things, I, 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 love, I, I love zoo, the zoo. I love the aquarium. I love all the animals. My favorite marine animal is a dolphin, okay? But one of the animals that I love when I go to the zoo, of course, you get to see the koalas. If you've ever been to SD, they're stinking cute, but they're a menace, man. They're nuts. <laughs> um, but one of the things that I love is the lion. The lion. See, when you think of a lion, can we just stand and look at that for a second? When you think of a lion, I think of the movies like The Lion King with Mufasa and Simba, <laughs> right? And I remember when Simba is going through his process and he was reminded that he had the voice of his father. And there's a spiritual symbolism when it comes to lions and their strength and their courage and their power and their royalty and the protection and the authority that they have. So what does a lion have to do with today's message? I believe that every single one of us has the voice of a lion and we need to let the lion out. Just check out this clip real quick, if you can show this one for me, guys. I want you to think about this. The roar. The roar of a lion is far more than just showing off. See, both male and female lions, they roar to communicate their location. They roar to communicate strength, to intimidate, to back off the enemy. Did you know that their warning can be as loud as 114 decibels? 
surround some of the jets that you hear and that their roar can be heard up to five miles away sometimes. I hope you know that there's an assignment against your life. See, as a follower of Jesus, we all have an enemy, one who would want nothing more for us than to just be silent, to be timid, to be fearful, instead of fearless, to be insecure, knowing that God is great, but yet doubting that he can really use us in our sound because there are other people who are qualified. When we know the reason behind our worship, we don't have to survive day by day, but we can actually thrive day by day. We can warge, wage war through our worship. See, if we keep believing the lies, we'll never be all that God has called us to be. You'll never be able to truly love God through your worship if you can't first love yourself with the love that he gives. So when the lies come, you can start to worship See, when you worship, I want you to get this. You're not adding to Jesus. Sometimes we, get, we lose this. You're not adding to Jesus. You're not giving him more power or strength. You're not filling up his cool meter. He's already God all by himself. Amen. See, our worship doesn't remind him of who he is. Jesus isn't having some identity crisis. He's not. But sometimes we get twisted and we think our worship is helping reinstate and remind him of who greedy is. He is God. He is truth. He is life. He is love. He is a light in the darkness. He knows everything from beginning to end, and he invites us into his story. See, John 8, 45 says this. So when I tell the truth, this is Jesus speaking to his disciples. He says, when I tell the truth, you just naturally don't believe me. Can I get an amen on that? I have my own insecurities. 39 years old, confident in a lot of things, but I will tell you today, insecurity reaps his head, ugly head, many times. And I wish I could stand here and say that I trusted God for every single one of them, but I've fallen. I've allowed the enemy to silence my sound. I've allowed situations and circumstances where I couldn't see a light hinder me from lifting my voice. Because of insecurity. Some of you may not have insecurities. Maybe you've got other different struggles, but it's the same thing. He's speaking to so many of us today, but naturally we don't believe him. And this is where we have to wage war, where we have to remember the reason why we worship, that the word of God is our weapon, that it stays sharper than any double-edged sword. So how do we use it? Does it just sit on the shelf or on the menu of our phone untouched until we come near to it and talk about it, right? If the word of God is a, a sword, then our worship is how we've got to learn how to swing it. Our worship has got to be a way that we begin to confess and declare his word, his truth, his life, his promises. Worship is an act of war. We don't sing to remind ourselves of all that we're not, but we lift up our voices to remind ourselves of all that God is. And we're waging war, and we're swinging the sword, and we're telling ourselves who God is. He doesn't need it, but I need it. He doesn't need it. You need it. We need it. We all need it. I sing And sometimes I have no idea what God is doing, but I know he's moving on earth as it is in heaven and that there are spiritual things that are happening in ways that I cannot see, but I know that my worship is doing something because it's the reason. I sing because I've got issues. And I need to remind myself of who God is. 
I believe that once this reason, listen Mesa, I believe that once this reason begins to sink in and really begins to take root, that we would be ready to wage war. That our worship, that our worship would be more than just a song, but it would be a declaration of who God is. To remind ourselves of how good and faithful he is. To remind ourselves that our worship would be more than just a song, but man, it's a battleground. See, Second Chronicles, and I'm going to get ready to close. I know I've said that like twice. <laughs> but Second Chronicles, in that chapter, in that, in that 20th chapter, the story of Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat, he succeeded his father, Asa, at the age of 35, and he ruled for 25 years. Did you know that when Jehoshaphat came into power, what did he do? He restored the temple. He saw that there were idols and that there were other gods false gods and different things that the people of god worshiped and that they idolized and that had their focus and their attention he said let's get rid of it all let's make things right let's restore the temple let's restore the tabernacle because of who our god is and he knew that there was something valuable in his worship and he was passionate about god but how many of you know that sometimes even the passionate people struggle? One of the weaknesses that Jehoshaphat had, because he's human, just like all of us, sometimes he made the wrong alliances. He had the best intentions, but came into insecurities with people who were offering alliances, which then eventually brought him into this chapter here at chapter 20, where three armies are planning to attack. Not just one, not two, but three massive armies. And we read what happened to the story, right? And they're planning to attack. And then if we look at, just jump a couple verses down in verse 12, it says, oh, our God, won't you stop them? We are powerless against this mighty army that is about to attack us. We do not know what to do, but we are looking to you for what? We are looking to you for what? So when you don't know what to do and your eyes are on him, when we fix our eyes on the Lord, he will come through. When we fix our eyes on Jesus, the spirit of God will speak. And as we walk into the battle, we will know that we're not just fighting with spears, but we are fighting with our worship. And our worship is an act of war. Come on. See, I don't understand. I don't know the full power and the weight of my praise. We don't understand and know the full power of our praise. It may not look like much, but when the Spirit of the Lord is there, nothing is impossible. So do you have a voice? Do you have a song to sing? Do you have something to declare today? Not that other people have to hear it, but that you need to hear it yourself. What's the reason behind our worship? See, when we sing and lift praise to God, we're lowering the voice of the enemy. And when we're fighting with our worship, what song, what song will we sing? What did they sing? Give thanks to the Lord. Give thanks to the Lord. Take a moment right now and think about the goodness of God. Worship him not just for what he has done, but what for, for what he is going to do, for who he is. Give thanks to the Lord. The next thing that they did, his love endures forever. When you don't know what to do, give thanks to the Lord and say what? God, your love endures forever. It's not about me confessing my love to God, or, but God's love for me. It's not just about the positive affirmations, but can I tell you, it's about our faith declarations. It's about what we declare within our own heart and our own mind and out of our soul. And the last two verses out of this chapter, verse 29 and 30, says this, when all the surrounding kingdoms heard that the Lord himself had fought against the enemies of Israel, what happened? The fear of God came over them catch this because Jehoshaphat knew that worship was an act of war some of you you're battling right now keep fighting through your worship 
And when the enemy hears of what God has done, the fear of God will come over them and Jehoshaphat's kingdom was at peace. For his God had given him rest on every side. Praise makes a way for peace. You see, if you're struggling right now, this is why we sing. This is the reason why we worship. It's why we declare our gratitude to God. That's the reason for our worship. And so in closing today, this is what I want to do. Rex, if you can just uh, lower the lights just a little bit. I want you all just to close your eyes for a moment. And Lord, we, uh, we say right now that we know that it's not just the song, but it's the heart. And it's the heart of your people. And right now, today, God, I declare that you would help us as individuals, that you would help us as Mesa Church, which is one congregation out of many congregations, you would help us, God, to discover our sound, to discover who you are. <laughs> 